Hey, everyone, and welcome to Livingston First Church. We're so glad you're joining us today. We really hope you're ready to hear a great message from the Word of God. So prepare your hearts, prepare your ears, and get ready to receive a blessing from the Lord. Be blessed. Lord, we love you. We love you. We just love you. Jesus, Jesus, we love you. Lord, we want to we know you. We want to know you, Jesus. We want to know you and we want to be intimate with you. We want to be transformed into your image, God. Jesus, we want our hearts to be on fire with you. Lord, would you consume us? Would you consume us again, God? Thank you for that time of worship, Jesus. Thank you for revealing things in us, God, and for moving things and transforming things in us, God. Lord, we thank you. We don't deserve that. It's your mercy and your kindness to do those things, God. So we we thank you, and we ask, God, that you would continue to do so, that you would continue to, to minister to us through your word. We love you, Jesus, and we ask that our mind and our hearts would be receptive and open to what you're saying right now, God. Lord, we say it again, we love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, uh, it's good to be with you guys again. I've been here, there, and everywhere. Uh, so, happy to be home uh, for a good while. Uh, before I left the second time, uh, we had started a series on the process. Does everybody remember? Anybody remember? A couple people remember. That's good. I'm glad you have some recollection. We're talking about process. How many of you know that you're called of God? It should be everybody, unless you don't know the Lord, and we can work that out. But you're called of God. God has a calling for your life, and it's glorious, and it's good, and it's great. And you need to know that. It's not something small and insignificant. Your life is to reveal glory. Your life is to reveal glory on the earth. That means that the call that God has on your life is meant to reveal His glory. There's nothing insignificant about what God wants to do in your life. That should get you a little bit excited. There's nothing insignificant about what God wants to do in your life. That's exciting, right? But with every call comes a process. And just as important as the call is, so is the process that gets you from being called to where you're going. Amen? Remember in 1 Samuel, we read it last week, David was anointed king by Samuel. And in that moment, the moment he poured oil on his head and proclaimed him king, he was then king before the eyes of God, right? But how many of us remember that there was a process from the time he was called until the day that he sat on the throne in Israel. Would David have chosen that process for himself if he had the option? Probably not, unless he's crazy. And it doesn't look like he was crazy, right? He wouldn't have chosen that for himself. How many of you know that if you, you do know that if you took a look back on the things that have happened in your life, you probably would not have chosen some of the things that you couldn't help that you walked through. Right? Some of the things that you've been through in your life that you had no control over, if you had control, you would not have walked through those things, would you have? But how many of you know that sometimes God gives us a process that's hard on us? Right? He, he gives us a process, and it's not that He wants to punish us or, or wear us out or beat us down. It's, it's because He wants to prepare us for what he's doing in us. He's refining our character, right? Character is more important than skill. Character is more important than talent. Character is what carries what God has put inside you. Amen? Right? Skills, talents, uh, all, all of your giftings, that comes from God. He's not impressed by what he's already given you. He's impressed by the character you allow him to develop through process <laughs> that you give back to him, right? Right? Remember in Deuteronomy 8, verses 2, 3, and we'll just read through these fast because this is a review. Remember, this is the Lord speaking to Israel about their time in the wilderness. Remember how the Lord God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character. How profound. 
and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. What's our sustenance? God's word, his call on our life. You live by God's word in your life. How do you learn to live by God's word? Through process. What is process refining in you? Your character. <laughs> if you don't get this, you'll always be wondering why you're stuck where you're stuck. <laughs> Until you understand that with every call comes a process that God has ordained into your life, you'll always be wondering why you're not seeing what you want to see. When you embrace process, you embrace God's call in your life. When you embrace process, you become undefeatable in what God has called you to as you go to battle against the enemy. <laughs> it's true. Is process fun? Most, most of the times, no. If, if I had it my way, I would have leapfrogged over many hard things that had happened in my life that I had no control over. But it's good. Process is hard, but it's good. <laughs> we don't like it, but we need it. It doesn't make sense, but it's a part of God's perfect plan for your life. And as I submit my will to God's will, I begin to understand what he's doing as I let go of my flesh and embrace his process for my life. Go to James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. So the last week, or the last time I preached, and by the way, Mike came and preached, and he, what did he preach on? Process. Do you know I didn't ask him to do that? I didn't even tell him what to preach. He just came here with a word from the Lord for this body about process. That's kind of amazing, isn't it? I think it is. So last week we talked about process, and then we talked about some keys to process. Learning how to work hard. If you don't have a job, get a job. That's where God will speak to you, right? Learn how to, to make commitments. Commit to the, to the local church. Allow commitments to be a guardrail, uh, that, that protects you from distractions. Remember those things? We're going to carry on. I'm going to talk a little bit more about process, but then I'm going to give you more keys so that you can embrace God's process for your life as you seek his destiny for what he's called you to. You guys okay? It's going to be a little tough. I'm going to step on your toes a little bit again. But that's, we like that, don't we? We're good with that. Okay. We need it. I need it too. James Chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. <laughs> Let me just say that. That's like hard to even read. <laughs> Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. I'm, amen, right? For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Whoa. I'm going to read that last part again. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect perfect and complete, needing nothing. Okay, that's, that's weighty, right? First of all, James commands us to, to embrace hardship. Ugh, whatever, James. Do, you do that. <laughs> he says, no, no, no. When you encounter hardships and trials, I want you to resist the urge to, to, uh, to assign complaining to what you're going through, to, to declaring that the enemy has come and won through complaining, and I want you to rejoice and take joy because you've been given an opportunity to grow in the Lord. <laughs> Think about that. When trials come, God is opening a door of opportunity to you that you may grow in endurance because endurance will make you more like Jesus than anything else 
<laughs> You'll do. Look, I'm, I'm for prayer. We have a prayer room. We, we are connected with prayer rooms. I'll get on my knees and pray all day long if I need to. But if I'm not willing to endure, I won't be able to pray. Right? I love fat. Well, I don't. Uh, Lord, help me. I don't love fasting. <laughs> I hate fasting, but I'll fast. I'll fast till my, my brain's out. I'll, I'll pray in tongues until I can't pray in tongues anymore. But if I can't endure, then I can't really do those things. See, you need to get some grit in your life. You need to put your foot down and say, I'm not going to move until God does what he says he's going to do in my life. You need a resolve, and the resolve only comes by accepting the hardships you're walking through. See, a lot of the time we want to rebuke the problem, but God says, hey, you're missing out on my plan because you won't let me refine your character and build your endurance by going through what I've ordained for your life. <laughs> See, this is important. You want to be more like Jesus? Build some endurance in your life. Get some resolve. Then go to war in prayer. Then go to war fasting. Then go to war praying in tongues and declaring and prophesying. First thing you need to do is decide, no matter what I go through, I'm not giving up. <laughs> That's what you need. Because as you learn to grow in endurance, the Lord makes you more like Jesus. As your character is refined... And you begin to steward what he's called you to because now you are embracing the call in your life. Process is unnatural to our flesh. It never feels good. Let's just be honest. Hardships don't feel good. Jesus never said in this life there will be many cuddly teddy bears and candy canes. Did he? No. And that's okay. He said that there'll be many sorrows and trials, but that doesn't mean that we lack joy. You know, you actually can't discover joy until you embrace hardship. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? You can't discover joy until you encounter hardship because you have to train yourself to see things from God's point of view rather than what you feel. It's a discipline. It's me saying, I don't really like this, but I know it's God's will for my life that I keep going forward. So I'm going to take a hold of joy and say, thank you, Lord, for letting me embrace this and walk through this. Because when I get out the other side, I'm going to look more like you and I'm going to step on the back of the enemy. And he's already beaten, so I don't need to worry about what he's doing. I just need to keep saying yes to what you called me to. I need to embrace your process. <laughs> See, it's not natural to your flesh. Your flesh is like, let's just go watch TV or look at Facebook or go to the swimming pool or do whatever we can to get out of this pain and distract ourselves. But we're missing out on walking in what God has called us to walk in. It's a discipline. That's why in Matthew 16, right, Jesus asks the disciples, who, who do men say I am? And they start saying, well, you're John the Baptist, you're the prophet Elijah, you're this, you're that. They're, they're speculating on who God says he is, on who Jesus is. But then what does Peter say? You're the son of God, you're the Messiah. And then what does Jesus respond to him? He says, Peter, that's it. But you didn't get that by your own revelation. You just received revelation from the Holy Spirit. And Jesus affirms him and says, good job, you get it. But then you read down a little bit further, and Jesus rebukes Peter, right? Jesus rebukes Peter. He starts to explain to them the process that he's going to walk through. He's explaining to them all the trials and the endurance and all the things that nobody wants to happen is going to happen. And Peter pulls him to the side. And he says, no, no, Lord, that's not for you. That's not for you. And what does Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. See, you need revelation to know the deity of Jesus. You need revelation to know who God is. But you also need revelation to embrace the process he's called you to in your life. See, you need discipline, but you also need a revelation from the Holy Spirit that this is what you're called to, and then another revelation to embrace it and endure it. Your flesh is rebelling against it. 
Your flesh doesn't like the plot process. Your flesh wants anything else other than walking through the trials that you've been called to walk through. So you need to discipline yourself to say yes, but then you need to invite the Holy Spirit to empower you and to give you perspective beyond what you feel. You need the power of the Holy Spirit to embrace God's process for your life. That means when I get into a tough situation and things don't feel good, I need to let go of complaining, number one. I need to forget cursing God for doing something that I don't like. Right? That's what Peter did. He was cursing God for doing something other than what he thought was right. So I need to get over that discipline. And then I need to say, Lord, thank you for leading me to this place. Now, would you please give me power from on high so I can embrace what you're calling me to and get through this trial and become more like you? That's how we walk through process. You need power from the Holy Spirit. You need a yes from your heart and then power from the Holy Spirit. How many of you are walking through something hard right now? You don't have to. Yeah, all of us. Duh. We're all humans. We're all walking on the planet. Today, you are fully equipped for what you're walking through. You just need two things, a yes in your heart and power from the Holy Spirit. And you have access to both. You have access to both. You can pray all you want. You can fast all you want. And those are good things. And those will shape and transform your spirit, man. But until you develop and, and discipline yourself to say yes to the process and to lean into the revelation of who Jesus is and what he's called you to, even though you may not like it, you'll always be stuck going in a circle. You'll always be trying to avoid the pain to find something comfortable but missing what you were called to. Process is hard. Okay. So we talked about working hard. Get it. I know we're all hardworking folks here. If you don't have a job and you need a job, get a job. God will speak to you in your place of work. Learn how to commit. Be a committing person, okay? People who can't commit usually, not always, are insecure about what God has called them to. So they use the excuse that, I just want to be open to what the Lord is doing. Well, if the Lord is doing something, he's going to commit you to a people. Learn how to commit, the second key. The third key, okay, third key, is cultivi cultivating a lifestyle of sacrifice and service, Okay? Cultivating a lifestyle of sacrifice and service. I know that sounds good, and it looks good on my notes too, I, I promise, but that's hard to do. You can't do that within your own power. Amen? Enduring unfair pressure and undeserved trials for the benefit of others is a normal part of walking out your destiny. couple people, let, let it ruminate for a minute, okay? Enduring unfair pressure and undeserved trials for the benefit of other people is a normal part of walking out your destiny in God. If we're using Jesus as the model, right? We're using Jesus as the template. If you're walking in your destiny, you might have to walk through some undeserved trials, can we make a list of how many things Jesus deserved before he went to the cross? Simple, right? Zero. God actually promotes and accelerates the lives of people who serve and sacrifice for others and for his kingdom. You were made for promotion. You were made for great things. You actually should have a desire to be promoted and to experience great things in your life. Why? Because you were made in God's image and we have a great God. If you don't have that desire, if you've got some sort of false humility working inside you that, that wants to make you think you always just need to be pressed down and forgotten and ignored, you, you, that's, not, that's not of God. You were made for great things. You were made for greatness. Now, the fall perverts that in our lives. The fall wants us to make our greatness about us and not him. But you were made for great things. But promotion 
in the kingdom only comes through a lifestyle of sacrifice and service for the benefit of others. We good? All right. I'll keep going. <laughs> God's people do not self-promote. Self-promotion is the ministry that got Lucifer kicked out of heaven. You don't have to promote yourself. God is capable of promoting you. He sees you better than you see yourself. And he desires to promote you further than you desire to be promoted. But you have to allow him to be your, your vindication. You have to allow him to validate you. Go to Matthew 20 with me real quick. I got plenty of time. I don't think the St. Peter's Peacocks played till four, so we're good. <laughs> What's that? Tar Heels. Yeah. What time do they play? Four o'clock. We're good. We got four hours, guys. <laughs> Matthew 20, verse 20. There's a great image online of uh, Jesus crossing up the devil and the devil falling to the ground during a basketball game, and Jesus is labeled St. Peter's Peacocks, and the devil is labeled Tar Heels. <laughs> Just kidding. Sorry. <laughs> Matthew 20, verse 20 through 28. Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request, he asked. She replied, in your kingdom... Please let my two sons sit in the places of honor next to you, one on the right and one on the left. But Jesus answered by saying to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Oh, yes, they replied, we're able. Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup, but I have no right to say who will sit on my right or on my left. The father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the ton other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. But Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be a servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Amen. I really love this scripture. This is so beautiful because, first of all, it's a bad idea to let your mama ask your boss for a promotion. <laughs> right? That's like step one. Don't let, don't let mama talk on your behalf. Like, you got to take care of your own business, son. Right? Number two, you can't live off the relationship that your parents have with Jesus. You need to walk out the process yourself right? You need to have your own relationship with God where he calls you to something and then he gives you a process that you wrestle with him over as you walk into your destiny, right? Doesn't work when mama and dad do it for you. It never will. It never has. That's where the two sons of thunder are right now. Though They come up to Jesus and they're like, mama, come on, ask him, ask him. And she's like, fine, fine. Shh, shh, be quiet. She goes up there. <laughs> she says, hey, Jesus, just a suggestion, when you establish your new kingdom of authority and you overthrow every other kingdom, do you think my sons can have the next highest positions of authority in your kingdom? And I imagine Jesus probably chuckled, right? Because how silly is this that mama is going to ask the boss for the promotion of her two sons? And he says, hey, look, first of all, are you ready to embrace the process that I'm about to embrace? Are you ready to drink from the bitter cup of suffering? Oh, totally. Yeah, we, you see us drink wine with you all the time. We got this. He's like, okay. Yeah, you will be ready one day, but it's not today. And also, by the way, no one promotes themselves in the kingdom other than God. You can't promote yourself. You can't leverage yourself. You can't use your relationships, your skills, your giftings. You can't make it happen for yourself if you're truly trying to grow into God's call for your life. That doesn't happen. 
The only way you can be promoted in God's kingdom is if he gives you more grace for what he's called you to. See, promotion in the kingdom only comes through the word of God. We can't live off of our own resource. We can't live off of our own bread. We have to embrace what he's doing, embrace the trials, embrace the hardship, then stop making it about us and begin to pour our lives out for the people around us. Of course, the other disciples see that they were smart enough to get their parents involved, and they get jealous, and they're like, who do they think they are? Why, why didn't we get our dad or our mom or our whatever? And Jesus got, goes, guys, you don't get it. You don't really understand what, what I'm saying. You're used to the world system where you press other people down to lift yourself up. I'm talking about a new system where you lay yourself down for the benefit of others around you so that the Father can then raise you up. See, it's not about not wanting greatness in your life. That's stupid. That doesn't even make any sense. You were designed and wired to want great things for your life. You can stop pretending now. You can stop pretending that, no, you know, that's, you know I'm, just, I'm just a humble servant. No, I get it, but if you're a humble servant, you're desiring great things of God's kingdom in your life. But great things in your life only come through laying your life down. Becoming a servant for the benefit of those around you so that God can then vindicate your life in a way you never could. You need to ask yourself on a regular basis. This needs to be a question that you ask yourself. You can ask this in life group if you want. Am I living in a way that betters the lives of the people around me and the community that I've been called to? <laughs> Read that one again. Am I living in a way that betters the lives of the people around me in the community that I've been called to. You need to discipline yourself to do the work nobody else wants to do. How many of you know if you only serve doing things that you like to serve in, you're not really serving your community, you're serving yourself? <laughs> what do we say in church when we don't want to do something somebody's asked us to do? I don't feel called to do that. <laughs> I don't feel called to do children's ministry or clean or... Any of those things I don't like to do. I, I, this is not me. Everyone feels this way. Nobody asked you if you were called. We were just telling you what's needed. <laughs> you guys okay? Did I step on your toes? <laughs> I felt that one. Nobody's worried about what you're called to. Serving is about filling the need. Right? If we're serving like Jesus, if we're serving like the world then you do only things that make you look good and that promote your skill sets and you just do what you're good at so you just look greater and greater and greater. But if you're serving like Jesus serves, if you're serving in a way that exemplifies the kingdom, you just fill the need whether it makes you look good or not. I like to think about Thanksgiving dinner. Best holiday ever. Thank you, pilgrims. Thank you, Indians. Thank you, Jesus. Thanksgiving is the best. A day filled with gorging yourself and watching football and sleeping on a couch. Who could have thought of a better holiday? <laughs> it's amazing. Right? And how do we serve at Thanksgiving? Everybody likes to make their favorite side dish, right? Aunt May brings the corn pudding. Uh, somebody else brings the stuffing. Somebody else does the meat. And everybody just does the thing that they feel makes them look the best. It's just, that's just how it is, right? That's what we do. But then after everybody's full of food and exhausted from eating, which is, it's like we exhaust ourselves from eating. That's amazing. What's left behind? A mess. And who, who wants to clean the dishes? You, one person in here. Nice. You're invited to every Thanksgiving dinner we ever have in our house. Forever. Nobody wants to do the dishes. Everyone's like, I made the corn pudding. I made the turkey. I made the stuffing. I made the green bean casserole. Nobody wants to do two to the dishes, 
But if nobody does the dishes, then Thanksgiving dinner is just a mess. It's the same in church. Everybody wants to serve in the things that make them look good and that they're used to doing and the things that they're comfortable doing. But if nobody does the hard work that nobody wants to do, you're left with a mess. See, serving is not about feeling good. Sorry, it's just the truth. If you're, if you're being empowered by the Holy Spirit, then you will see needs around you, things that just are not right, and then you just fill that need regardless of how it feels because you know you've been empowered and equipped to do what he's called you to do. Right? Can I get an amen? amen. This is a word of affirmation? <laughs> <laughs> okay, point number four, key number four to walking and embracing your process as you, as you watch God fulfill the call in your life. This is the most important one, in my opinion, is you got to learn to love yourself. You got to learn to love yourself. It's easy to, to pretend to love other people, but you actually have to love yourself. You have to like who you are. You ever like lay in bed late at night and think of something really embarrassing and stupid that you did maybe like six months ago, just like pops in your head and your whole body like convulsed like, oh, yeah. <laughs> why did I do that? <laughs> we're, we're good at being our own critics, aren't we? We're, we're good at finding flaws within ourselves because you know yourself the best. Nobody knows you like you know yourself. Despite all the things you know about yourself, despite all your flaws, despite all the things that you would change if you had the power to change them, despite how insecure you might feel about who you are, God still loves you, and he's fighting for you right now, and he's equipping you with his power, with his spirit, with his kingdom, and he's giving you access to all of heaven, not because he loves you, that's important, Jesus does love you, but he also likes you. You've got to learn to like yourself. <laughs> I know it sounds silly, but if you don't like yourself, you'll never love people around you. You'll be good at faking it, and you'll be able to like, get your social cues down and be socially responsible and not be a mean, angry Christian person, but if you don't like yourself, you'll never love people around you. That's why Jesus said the greatest commandments, or God said the greatest commandments, love the Lord your God, but then to love your neighbor as you love. Because to the degree that you love yourself is to the degree that you can love people around you. And here's the thing, is process is hard. And the enemy does a really good job of making you feel like you're getting what you deserve. You're not, I promise you. If we all got what we deserved, there would not be a person in here. We'd all be six feet underneath soil right now. And to some degree, you need to like clean up your messes from your past and you know, walk through some things that you created in your own life. But if you got what you deserved, there'd be lightning bolts hitting every person in this place in this moment. You are not getting what you deserve. You are walking through a process that's refining your character so you can carry the call God has put onto your life. <laughs> and he's not doing it because he's mad at you and he needs to teach you a lesson. He's doing it because he cares about you. And he loves you. And he doesn't want what he's called you to do to crush you because he wants you to do great things. He wants you to do exploits for his kingdom. He wants to do things through you that you never imagined for yourself because you don't like yourself the way the Father likes you. And the best way you can learn to like yourself is to fall in love with Jesus. Just fall in love. <laughs> Just fall in love. Because once you fall in love, then you can begin to give him thanks for the things that he's doing. See, outside the context of love, process is evil. Right? Outside the, the parameters and the boundaries of love, hardships are evil. Why would a good father want you to walk through pain if there's not the boundary lines of love around what he's doing in your life? 
See, God likes you. God loves you. He loves you more than you like yourself. He likes you more than you like yourself. And he allows you to walk through things that don't make sense because they make sense to him and they're good for your life. And your, your biggest battle is not going to be uh, praying more, fasting more. It's going to be getting resolve, but also learning to love God so you can like yourself. Actually, I think the Lord wants to do something today. I think he wants to break something off of us. I bet you, like me, can look back over your life and think of at least two dozen things that you would change if you had the power to change. Right? Like, if I look back on my past and all the things I've been through, I could find at least two dozen things that I would like to say, Lord, I didn't like that. Why did you let me go through that? And the Lord says today, he says, I don't actually need you to understand. I, I don't need you to understand, but you need to fall in love with me so you can begin to give thanks for what I've done and what I'm doing. So you can begin to get over what you don't like and embrace what I've called you to. So you can begin to embrace the process that I've ordained for your life, like David, like Joseph, like Daniel, like every other person in the Bible who's been called to great things. So you can embrace it, overcome it, and do what I've made you to do. So your destiny is hidden and falling in love with him, not just for what he can do, but what he is doing in your life right now. Why don't you, I don't know, bow your head or close your eyes, or whatever you need to do. But I want to pray. Holy Spirit, would you come right now? Would you come right now? We're just going to wait on you, Lord. Would you come right now? Father, would you show us the things in our lives that we've, we've gone through, that maybe we're still going through, and like Peter, we, we've tried to rebuke. God, would you show those, those things that you've allowed us to walk through that we don't really like, that like Peter, we've tried to like, pull you to the side and twist your arm to do something else. And then like Peter again, Lord, after he betrayed you, after he, he wandered around wondering what his destiny was, Lord, you met him on the beach and you ate breakfast with him. You met him at the beginning of a new day and you said to him, Peter, do you love me? And Peter, I imagine Peter you said back to you, Lord, yeah, you know I love you fully aware of his insecurity and his failure and all the things he messed up and didn't do right. And then you said, yeah, 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 but Peter, do you love me? And you were provoking and prodding, Lord, and, and, and revealing the things that he didn't agree with that you were doing in his life, the places where he failed and messed up and didn't embrace the process. And again, he said, Lord, you know that I love you. But Lord, you, you don't give up on us. You don't let us stay in our insecurity because you like us that much. You said again, Lord, Peter, do you love me? <laughs> and Lord, just imagine at that point, Peter was on the floor a mess. Lord, you know I love you. It's not always made sense, God, but you know I love you. You know I choose you. You know I choose you despite the pain, despite the hardship, despite the things I don't understand. You know I choose you. And then, Lord, you said, then be who I've called you to be. Feed my sheep. Walk in my call. Embrace what I'm doing. So right now, Lord, I want you to show us 
by the power of your Holy Spirit, the places in our lives where we've not been able to give you thanks. For the things we didn't understand, I want you to give us power to give us thanks. Give us, give us the power to say thank you for that disappointment. Give us the power to say thank you for the pain. Give us the power to say thank you to the things we don't understand. Come on, just right now, let him, let him break you and say thank you for the thing you've been rebuking him for. Lord, I thank you for allowing me to walk through that relationship. Lord, I thank you for letting me lose that person. Lord, I thank you for that trial, for that hardship. Lord, I thank you. Come on, all all you have is your yes and your ability to yield. Just give him thanks for those things now. He didn't do it because he was angry at you. He didn't do it because he was mad at you. He did it because he loves you and he has great things planned for your life. So give him thanks. We're not going to move on until something breaks. Give him thanks. Give him thanks. I thank you, Lord, for breaking me by letting me go through that thing I didn't understand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you that you're a good God, that you love us, that you have a great plan for our lives. Father, we bless your name. We bless your name. Holy Spirit, would you come now and would you give us power to say yes to your process? to say yes to your process. We embrace it, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks so much for joining us today. It's our hope and prayer that the Holy Spirit truly ministered to you through this message from the Word of God. If you'd like to know more, look us up at livingstonfirstchurch.com or follow us on social media. And we look forward to seeing you in person soon.